So we left off with PHP installed on our server and we're able to get this index.php page because we've configured Nginx and of course installed PHP and configured that as well. So the next thing I want to do is actually install a Laravel application on our server and then we'll see what that involves. Specifically, we'll see how to set up our server to talk to GitHub and then we'll see what permission issues we run into and how to resolve them. So the first thing we're going to do here is actually install Composer. And I'm just going to hop on over to sudo su, which is going to make me the user root. So the su command can let you switch users. Like I could do sudo su fideloper to switch to user fideloper, but if you just do su without defining any user, it'll bring you to user root. So I'm going to run this one line command and it's going to curl the installer script for Composer. It's going to pipe that to PHP using sudo, although I'm user root, so I don't necessarily need to type in sudo here, but it won't hurt it. And then we're going to do two dashes to tell PHP to read in from standard in. In other words, it's going to read in the script that we install here from curl. So we're using curl that pumps out the contents of the installer page, which is a PHP script. We pipe it to PHP and then we pass PHP some flags and it's just going to say the installation directory, where to put composer and then what to name the composer.far file. And we're just going to name it composer so we don't have to type in composer.far in order to execute it. All right, so I can say which composer and let's see, it might not find this because, oh, it does. Good. So if I list out the directory user local bin and I'm going to grab, I'm going to search for composer. We'll see it's there and we'll see that it's executable. So we should be all set. All right, so I'm going to exit, which will bring me back to user fideloper on the server. And the next thing I need to do is to give myself access to GitHub. And I want to show you how to talk to GitHub using SSH keys, which is the way you'll probably be doing it in any kind of production setup where you have a private repository. So that's fairly simple. The first thing we need to do is just create an SSH key on our server here. And this will create a private key and a public key. And we give GitHub the public key so that it knows that we can communicate to it. So SSH keygen is the command. This will be very familiar to you from the previous videos about creating SSH keys. The type is RSA, the bytes 4096 F. We're going to create it in my home directory, user fideloper, the SSH directory in there, and I'm going to call it ID underscore RSA. And then we have dash capital C here, just to add a comment here, which is a nice way to show who the owner of that key is and what its purpose is. All right, so it's generating that. I want no password since we might use this for automation in the future. I just want it to be able to connect without a password. And we can see it's created IDRSA and IDRSA.pub inside of my SSH directory. So I can cat out IDRSA.pub and we'll see the public key along with the comment here that we added at the end. And I'm going to copy this and we can put it into GitHub. Now over in GitHub, I have a repository server start here that we're going to use. And I'm going to go to settings here and deploy keys, which is a pretty handy way to set up SSH access to a specific repository. So I'll add a deploy key. I'll call it SFH start here server. I'll paste in the public key. I'm not going to allow write access because we're only going to pull from the server. We're not going to push to GitHub ever. So I'm just going to have a read only access key with our public key here. We'll add it and that'll create the key. So that's here. It's not been used yet. We know that. Let's head on over here and we'll test it by doing SSH dash capital T get at github.com, which will test the connection to GitHub using the SSH key. And we can see we permanently added it, uh, GitHub to known host. That's great. And um, you successfully authenticated and it specifically knows the repository we are authenticated with because it's a deploy key for that specific repository. Now you could also go ahead and add a SSH key to the user's account. And then that SSH key will give access to anything the user will have access to. So for me, that means a lot of stuff. So I don't really like doing that. I don't really want this SSH key to give me access to all the organizations I have and all the repositories I have access to, right? So I've locked it down. So it's really only giving me access to this one repository server start here. Okay, so what I want to do here is keep my Nginx configuration the same because it's already set up for PHP and I'm going to put an application inside the HTML directory. So I'm actually going to remove the HTML directory, sudo remove, r for recursive, f to force. In other words, it won't prompt us to ask everyone to delete anything specifically. It'll just go ahead and delete it. And then I'm going to delete the HTML directory. Now, the only thing inside of the HTML directory is that index.php page, which had the PHP info dump. So I just deleted it. If I reload our server, we'll see not found because the directory and the index.php file no longer exists. And I'm going to actually head to my home directory. And let's see, I should have Git already, and I do. Great. And it's version 274. Nice. Okay, so we can go ahead and just clone this repository. Now remember, I'm in the home directory for user fideloper, which means I'll have permission to write to this directory. So if I just run git clone here, I'll be able to write to the home directory for my user, and I'll be able to clone this. 
So I'm gonna grab the URL for the SSH base connection here, and I'm gonna create this inside a folder HTML, and I did it. All right, so I'll list it out. I'll list out HTML. We'll see an application in there. So now I'm gonna sudo move HTML into var dub dub, and head to var dub dub, and we'll see we have the HTML directory in there, and with HTML, of course, we'll have the Laravel application. All right, so we have to do a few things to get this running. I'm gonna head back to Safari, refresh this, we'll get forbidden, because this time, Nginx doesn't have permission to read from the right directory. So there's no index.php file in here, and in fact, our web root should be pointing to the public directory. So if I do sudo vim etsy nginx sites available default, we'll see the web root is still var html. So we want to follow Laravel conventions and have it pulling from the public directory. So our code will live in HTML, but the web server should be pulling from the public directory only. So that's where we set as the web root. Save and quit that. sudo nginx-t to test that, and it worked. So sudo service nginx reload to reload that configuration. Come back here, and we should see a white screen of death. Perfect, we do. Okay, so I'm gonna head into HTML, and we need to do a few things to get Laravel working. First, we don't have a .m file. So I'm gonna copy .env.example and create the .m file. Then I'll do PHP artisan key generate to generate a key for that. And let's see what it did it like. Okay, so I need some Laravel stuff in order to even run an artisan command, which just means we need to run composer install to get the dependencies for this Laravel application. Okay, and I actually stop this early because we're running into this warning. So I am grabbing most dependencies fine, I believe, but the zip extension and unzip command are both missing, and Composer tries to grab from distribution first instead of cloning through git, because cloning is a slower process. So what we can actually do here is sudo apt get install dash y zip and unzip, so we have those on the server, and this will allow git to use those. All right, so now let's try Composer install and see what we get. Okay, it's grabbing them, and it's actually grabbing them a lot faster because it's grabbing from distribution instead of cloning the repository. So that's a much quicker way to get your composer dependencies. Okay, now let's do php artisan key generate. All right, so we have the application key. Okay, so we have a .m file. We have our composer dependencies. Let's head on back over to our browser and see that we still get the white screen of death. And now we need to figure out why. Now, I happen to know from experience, this is about permissions. So in order to get to this page in Laravel, Laravel writes to the view cache and may also hit an error, and then when it hits an error, it tries to write to the Laravel log. Both of those things require permissions to write to certain directories within Laravel. So in storage, we have logs, and there's nothing in there, right? There's no Laravel.log file, so we don't know what the error message is really. So what is going on here? All right, let's list out the processes here. So we know we're running Nginx. Nginx is running as user www data, the worker processes that actually fulfill web requests. Then we can also see PHP FPM. So we'll do PSAUX, we'll grep for PHP, and we see PHP FPM workers are running for pool www as user www data as well. So PHP, the process that's processing our web requests, is running as user and group www data, but our files here are all owned by user and group fideliver, and our directories and files cannot be written to by other. So www data is other in this case because the user and group is fideliver. Therefore, PHP can't write to these directories. So the easy solution here is to do sudo chown r to make it recursive, and we're changing the owner and we're gonna make it www data as the user, and I'm actually gonna do the colon, which will implicitly say also do the group as www data. But just adding the colon there will do that for us as well. So the directory I want to affect is HTML, and that should now be all owned by www data. So I'll get into HTML, and we'll see the resources directory, or I'm sorry, the storage directory is also owned by user and group www data. We'll head back here, and then we see the Laravel page as we should. So I'll go to storage, or I'll list it out, and we we'll should see, well, we don't see a cache directory in there, but if we go to app, there's public and framework. We have a cache in there, and we have a view cache in here as well. And if I had an error, it would go to storage logs, but we haven't had an error yet too. But if we did, Laravel would be able to write to the log file here. So we did a few things in this video. One, we set up an SSH key, and we put that into git as a deploy key for a specific repository. Then we cloned the repository. We got Composer and installed our Composer dependencies. We saw we had some issues with that, and we installed zip and unzip so we could use that. And we can grab the Composer dependencies from distribution. In other words, we grabbed a zip file from Git instead of having to clone each Git repository. We created a M file, and we did php artisan key generate so that it could generate a new key for the application. 
And then we still had the wait screen of death and we saw it was related to permission issues. So the really important point here is to see a way to tell what user is running PHP. So PHP is running as user and group data and our permissions didn't line up, right? It was owned by user and group Fideliper. User and group Fideliper could read and write all these directories, but other could not. And WWW data would be other because it was neither the user nor the group. So we changed the ownership to the same owner that PHP is running for these web files to user and group WWW data, and then we could write to these directories. So Laravel is properly able to do what it needs to do to run. Now, WWW data is something that is created when you install something web related, so Nginx or PHP, if that user doesn't already exist. And often that user just exists out of the box in Ubuntu and Debian servers. On Red Hat or CentOS servers, you typically will see a user Apache. And even though you might not be using Apache, you still generally run stuff as that user because these are the users that are set up by default on Red Hat or CentOS or on Debian and Ubuntu just by convention. They aren't users that you can log in with but they are system users that exist on the server. So let's see, we'll cat Etsy password and we just get our list of users and their IDs. WWW data is here. It's user and group ID 33. So the UID, user ID is 33. GID, group ID is 33. Part of group WWW data. It has a home directory of var www. And its shell is set to user sbin no login, which is a thing used similar to binfalse to tell the server that this user is not allowed to log in. In other words, no one can SSH in as this user. And that's why the user of WWW data exists. By convention, it's a system user. It is not allowed to use sudo, and it's something that can't be logged in with, so a user can't use it or exploit it to find a way to log in as user WWW data. So it's relatively safe to use that user for web stuff, to run your applications, in other words.